kind of to have a business today. I have a methods today, especially for the new year. So, uh, and to state the things I think God's going to accomplish to us in the upcoming year. And it's taken from Numbers 20, verses 1 to 12, as was ably read by Elder Brady a few minutes ago. I'll read it again, but this time I'm reading in a new living translation of the Bible. Numbers chapter 20, verses 1 through 12. It says, in the first month of the year, the whole community of Israel arrived in the wilderness of Zin and camped at Kadesh. While they were there, Miriam died and was buried. There was no water for the people to drink at that place. So they rebelled against Moses and Aaron. The people blamed Moses and said, if only we had died in the Lord's presence with our brothers. Why have you brought the congregation of the Lord's people into this wilderness to die, along with all our livestock? Why did you make us leave Egypt in the first place and bring us here to this terrible place? This land has no grain, no figs, no grapes, no pomegranates, and no water to drink. And the Bible says in verse 6, that Moses and Aaron turned away from the people and went to the entrance of the tabernacle, where they fell face down on the ground. Then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord said to Moses, you and Aaron must take the staff and assemble the entire community. As the people watch, speak to the rock over there, and it will pour out its water. You will provide enough water from the rock to satisfy the whole community and their livestock. So Moses did as he was told. He took his staff from the place where he had kept it before the Lord. Then he and Aaron summoned the people to come together at the rock. Listen, you rebels, he shouted. Must we bring water from this rock? Then Moses raised his hand and struck the rock twice and water gushed out. So the entire community and their livestock drank their fill. But verse 12 says, But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust me enough to demonstrate my holiness to the people of Israel, you will not lead them into the land I have given them. You will not lead them into the land I have given them. For the next few moments, I want to focus on this text on this, the sermonic title, God's doing a new thing. God's doing a new thing. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we're about to end one year and start a new year, the year 2023. But we dare not start this year without guidance from you as to what direction you want us to take as individuals, what direction you want us to go as a family, but most of all, what direction you want us to head in as your church. So meet with us today, Father, on this last day of the year 2022. And give us your directives as to how you want us to proceed. We don't want to take a step further without hearing a word from you, Father. So do not disappoint us today. We act in these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Now, churches of all denominations, unfortunately, including the Seventh Day Adventist Church, are presently facing in the midst of an existential crisis. Existential crisis that might very well cause the existence that involves the existence of the church. To the crisis concerns preaching and making the gospel relevant to the life experiences of the younger generations. Millennials and Generation Zers are leaving the church in record numbers. Millennials or Generation Y are anyone born from the year 1981 to about 1994, 1996. They're currently between the ages of 25 to 40, and they presently constitute 72.1 million of the US population. Now, Generation Z, is a generation that follows, and they are those born between 1996 to the mid 2000. My son is Generation Z. Okay, and they constitute approximately 90 million of the U.S. population. Here, the millennials and Generation Z 
constitute almost 52% of the US population. Now, a few research studies recently found that 40% of all millennials now say that they have no religious affiliation. You don't have to claim any religion. Okay. And 70 to 75% of the young Christians in Generation Z, they live in the church immediately after high school. Our churches have been hallowed of the members of millennials and generations. Any of you who grew up in Miami know that churches like Bethany, Northside, Tabernacle, used to be bursting in the scenes with young people. You go to these churches right now, and it's stragglers, mostly older people in those churches right now. The youth population of many of our churches has been decimated, especially here in North America. Now, our present inability to reach the millennials shows us one thing, that past success in reaching young people does not necessarily guarantee our future success. See, our present inability to reach young people is quite perplexing. Because in the past, the church excelled in areas of youth ministry. See, in the late 70s and the 80s, when I grew up in the church, we were packed brim to the brim with young people. And the churches in the Caribbean, Sister Josh could attest to that. There were more young people than all the people in the church. As a matter of fact, the church was known for its vibrant youth ministry programs. But here's the thing, past success does not always promote present success. See, past success is not always an indicator of present success. As a matter of fact, past success can sometimes be an obstacle to present success. Yeah. And today's scripture is a clear example of this. See, the Israelites have been in slavery in Egypt for over 400 years. And the Bible says that they cry out to God because of their affliction, that God heard their oppression, and God orchestrated their rescue through Moses. Now, throughout this dramatic rescue enterprise, God habitually demonstrated his power through Moses' staff. Okay, Moses threw down his staff before Pharaoh, and it became a serpent. He picked it back up, it became a staff again. Moses lifted up his staff and touched the Nile River and it turned into blood. He lifted up his staff and plagues came down on Egypt. Moses lifted his staff at the Red Sea and the sea parted and the Israelites truck went through on dry land. Moses and his staff had become a very powerful duo for the Lord. But the emancipation from slavery in Egypt was only the beginning of the story. Because the children of Israel, after they left Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, they crossed into the barren wilderness of Sinai, where they faced countless seemingly insurmountable obstacles, and the least of which was, which was a severe sh shortage of food and water. See, on one such occasion, while they were camped at Rephidim, the children of Israel ran out of water. Bible says. They became angry if Moses would deliver them into a place without water. Though it was not Moses, it was actually God that was leading them in the cloud. But they became angry if Moses for leading them to a place without water. They began complaining, why did you share to kill us of thirst? Their complaints soon escalated to full out rebellion. Moses prayed and asked God what he should do. And God told Moses to take his staff and to strike the rock. And after he struck the rock, as God instructed him to, water flowed out of the rock in sufficient quantities to not only fill all of Israel, but all of their flock. See, Moses and his staff had become an extremely powerful duo for the Lord. A duo that was enough to overcome any obstacle the children of Israel faced while they were in the wilderness. But in our text for today, a similar scene unfolds. See, the children of Israel arrive at the wilderness of Zin 
And the Bible says that they set off camp at Kadesh. And while camp at Kadesh, they again run out of water and food. Again, they began to complain to Moses just as they did at Rephidim. They again got angry with Moses for leading them into a place with no water and food, the Bible says. Their complaints again escalated to full out rebellion. And Moses, as he had done many times before, he turned to God for help. The Bible says in Numbers chapter 20, verses 6 to 8, that Moses and Aaron turned away from the people, went to the entrance of a temple, where they fell face down on the ground. Then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to them. And, Moses, and the Lord said to Moses, you and Aaron must take the staff, assemble the entire community, and as the people watch, God said, speak to the rock over there, and it will pour out its water. You will provide enough water from the rock to satisfy the whole community and their livestock. So Moses did what God asked him to. He took his staff, and with his staff in his hand, he assembled Israel before the rock. And in verse 10, the Bible says, Then Moses and Aaron served the people to come together at the rock. Listen, you rebels, he shouted. Must we bring you water from this rock? But the Bible says that something happened to Moses between communicating with God and assembling the people at the rock. Because the Bible states in verse 11, Then Moses raised his hand and struck the rock twice with his staff, and water gushed out. See, rather than obeying God's command and speaking to the rock as God had instructed Moses, the Bible states that Moses struck the rock twice with his staff. Moses obeyed God's express command. Now, he was not guessing about it. God told him directly what he wanted him to do. But Moses chose to disobey God's express command and struck the rock with his staff instead of speaking to the rock as God had commanded him to. Now, my question for you today, what I'd like to explore for the rest of the sermon, is why? Why did Moses disobey God and strike the rock instead of speaking to the rock? Now, in Moses' defense, you must consider the sea. Moses was literally between a rock and a hard place. He was facing a furious mob of hungry, thirsty people who were ready to attack him if they did not, pro he did not provide them with food and water. His neck was literally on the line. And Moses needed a guaranteed, proven solution, something he could count on, a way of supplying water that could not fail. So Moses turned to what had always worked with him in the past, his staff. To pray of the people and the desperate need to control the outcome caused Moses to disregard God's express command and to instead trust in a proven method that had worked with him in the past, a proven formula, which was his staff. He put his faith in the sure thing rather than putting his faith in God. He put his faith in his staff rather than putting his faith in God. Now, Moses' failure at Kadesh Burnham illustrates three of the greatest obstacles to success that we face as individuals and as a church. I'll give you those three, and then we will be done. Now, the first lesson it teaches us is that focusing on past success rather than focusing on God can become an obstacle to success. That focusing on past success rather than focusing on God, can become an obstacle to success. See, past success is not always a reliable indicator of present success. Past success does not always guarantee present success. Past success does not always promote present success. As a matter of fact, past success can sometimes be an obstacle to present success. Why is that? Because we sometimes assume that the way God has worked in the past is how he will continue to function indefinitely in the future. 
In other words, we believe that God can only deliver us in the same way that he delivered us in the past. That God can only deliver us using the same means that he did in the past. That God can only deliver us using the same methods that he did in the past. And as such, our past success can become a means of boxing God in, a means of limiting God's power, a means of limiting God to deliver us in a different way in the present than he did in the past. See, sometimes we get so stuck in the past, so glued to the way that we stifle God's ability to move in new ways in the present. Stifle God's ability to lead us in new directions in the present. We stifle God's ability to deliver us by using new means in the present. We stifle God's ability to bless us in different ways in the present. See, just because God granted us success as a church in the past, employing a particular evangelistic method, does not guarantee present success when we employ the same method today. God may be doing a new thing in our time. For example, when the church began, the new technology available at the time was the printing press. And the church used the printing press with astounding success. Our pioneers relied heavily on the printing press to spread the gospel and God blessed the work tremendously. But just because God granted us success as a church in the past by using the printing press, does not guarantee us present success when we use the same method, the printing press. Why? Because God may be doing a new thing in our time. In the 1950s and 60s and 70s, the most effective method of spreading the gospel was crusades and tent meetings. That's so why a lot of us were converted by crusade and tent meetings. And the church relied heavily on crusade and tent meetings with phenomenal results. But just because God granted us success as a church in the past while using crusade and tent meetings does not guarantee present success if we use the same methods today. Why? Because God may be doing a new thing in our time. Now, just because God granted us success in the past while using the Pacific worship style does not guarantee present success if we use the same worship style today. Now, I grew up in the Caribbean. I grew up in La Bay, SDA, in Satushan. Okay? And I love hymns. That's all we sung. We sung hymns in worship, church flourished and bloomed. Church was packed to the, to the brim. But just because God granted us success as a church in the past, singing hymns in worship, does not guarantee us present success while we sing the same hymns today. Why? Because God may be doing a new thing in our time. Oswald Sanders stated, a great deal more failure is the result of an excess of caution than of bold experimentation with new ideas. He says the frontiers of the kingdom of God were never advanced by men and women of caution. Success in ministry can only be achieved if we have the faith and the courage to follow God wherever he leads. Because sometimes our past success can be an obstacle to our present success. Now, the second lesson he teaches us is that focusing on principles rather than focusing on God can be an obstacle to success. That focusing merely on principles rather than focusing on God can be an obstacle to success. See, we assume that the way God worked in the past is the way he will continue to work indefinitely in the present and the future. And we think that once we've discovered the principles that govern God's action in the past, we can employ the same principles with guaranteed results, guaranteed success in the present. Thereby, we reduce and limit God's confidence to a reproducible formula that we believe will guarantee success. 
We frequently use phrases that God always does blank, or God never does blank, or God only does blank. With absolute certainty that we've figured God out. We figured out how God operates. And we place our trust in the principles of God rather than God himself. But this is a grave error that Moses tragically discovered. Because God is too big. He's too immense. He's too limitless. He's too infinite to fit into any of our puny success formulas, any of our puny success principles. None of our human principles or formulas are big enough to encompass everything we do. God will always surprise us. He will always burst out of our simple human principles and formulas because they are too small to encompass everything he is. They are too small to contain him. That is why focusing on principles rather than focusing on God can become an obstacle success. And the first, third, and final lesson it teaches us is that focusing on outcomes and effectiveness rather than focusing on God can become an obstacle success. Focusing on outcome and effectiveness can become an obstacle success. See, effectiveness is an odd value to be held in such high regard by folks who claim to believe in a sovereign, unsearchable God. To guarantee effectiveness requires one to be in control of every minute detail and variable in an enterprise. But if we're in control of the outcome, what room does that leave for God to act? If everything happening can be explained by human causality, by our actions, then why do we need God in the first place? See, as a church, we sometimes tend to rely too heavily on research and studies that measures the effectiveness of a particular approach or program. Because while studies have been able to tell us which principles of life business or ministry are most effective, a research method has not yet been developed or invented, which measures whether a thing is right, which measures whether a principle is God-ordained, or which measures whether a principle is God's will. That can only be achieved through prayer and spiritual discernment. See, many times we assume that God values effectiveness as much as we do. We therefore conclude that the most effective principle or method is the one which God would employ and thereby remove the need for prayer. We remove the need for spiritual discernment. We renew the, we remove the need for God's active participation in the process. But here is the thing, effectiveness does not automatically guarantee God's approval. Because in our text today, Moses obeyed, obeyed God by striking the rock with his staff, instead of speaking to the rock as God had commanded him to. But the Bible says that after Moses struck the rock, the water gushed. So much so that the entire community of Israel and all the flock were drank to their fill, the Bible says. From a human perspective, Moses was a kind of success. His ministry was extremely successful. He was extremely effective from a human perspective. But while everyone was congratulating and praising Moses for his success, God remained unimpressed, the Bible says. Right. And the Bible says in Numbers 20, 12, but the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust me enough to demonstrate my holiness to the people of Israel, you will not lead them into the land I've given them. See, God performed this miracle in spite of Moses, not because of Moses. God performed the miracle in spite of Moses, not because of Moses. While Moses may have been effective from a human perspective, effectiveness does not always guarantee God's approval. See, sometimes focusing on God's dealing with us in the past can be beneficial. And remind us if God was able to do it for us in the past, he will do it for us again in the present and in the future. But as Moses learned, sometimes focusing too much on God's dealing with us in the past can also be detrimental. 
because it may blind us to how God is presently trying to bless us. It may frustrate God's ability to move in new ways in the present. It may frustrate God's ability to shoot up, lead us in new ways. It may frustrate God's ability to deliver us in new ways. It may frustrate God's ability to bless us in new ways. Because God may be trying to do a new thing in our time. Isaiah chapter 43, verses 18 through 19 says, Isaiah 43, verses 18 to 19, it says, Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. See, God has promised to do a new thing in our time. And he's cautioning us to do not remember the former things, nor even consider the things of old, because behold, I will do a new thing in your time. See, I am convinced that God will do a new thing in Coconut Grove in the year 2023. I believe it with every fiber in my being. And the word that God has given me for you today is to do not remember the former things. Do not consider the thing of, things of old, because behold, a new thing in Coconut Grove in the year 2023. I will even make roads in the wilderness and rivers in the dirt. God has a new blessing in store for Coconut Grove in the year 2023. New mountains to climb, new victories to win, new achievements to achieve, new accomplishments to attain. But these blessings are only for those who have the faith and the courage to follow God wherever he leads. Those who are willing to go where God says go, to follow where God leads, to pursue the goal that God says pursue, and to pursue the goal in the manner that God says pursue them. Yeah. See, God will accomplish the impossible for us in the year 2023. But we have to be willing to follow God wherever he leads. So this is what I'm proposing. This is what I'm proposing. That as a church, we come together and we seek God's presence. We seek his face. We ask God what direction does he want us to go in as a church. We don't assume it for ourselves. We don't assume it based on our past experience. But we seek God's face and ask him, what direction do you want us to go? What steps do you want us to take? Do you want us to fulfill it? And we have the discernment and the faith and the trust enough in God to follow wherever he leads. Do it in whatever manner he instructs us to. And to permit God to take charge of our church. And I promise you, if we do this, we will do marvelous things in the upcoming year. That God will form roads in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. He will work right now. But we will overcome things and obstacles which seem impossible right now. But in order to do this, we must be at God's disposal. Not God at our disposal, but we at God's disposal. Instead of inviting God into our plans, we need to find out what God's plans are and put ourselves in his plan. Instead of inviting God in our plan, we follow God's plan. We make God the leader of this church, COVID and grow once more. And I promise you, he will do amazing things in the year 2023. Heavenly Father, we are grateful that we serve a God who is able to do anything but fail. And we trust that you have great plans for us as, as a church community in the year 2023. So we ask that you prepare our hearts even Help us to be able to hear and discern your voice, but most of all, to follow wherever you lead. To let you be the leader, the head of your church, and to go in the direction that you call us. So Father, we have a great work ahead of us. Because you have called us to spread the gospel into all the world. And we're facing a crisis as a church where we have an inability to spread it to the younger generations. 
So show us what method we need, what changes we need to make, what paths we need to follow, exactly how you want us to do this thing. Because this doesn't catch you by for crime. You have a plan to save the young people. And if we get into your program, we will, we will achieve the success that you desire us to. You're soon to come back and take us home with you, Father. So prepare us for your kingdom and help us to take as many other young people with us as is possible. We ask the signature to stand before you say. Amen. Amen. Amen.